Nah. Splish. Wait. several ways to give here you're going to see a link pop up you'll see some instructions on how you can give so while you're waiting prep your heart and we're getting ready for an incredible word in just a few minutes atmosphere every thought every whisper every unclean thing in Jesus name God we bind up all flesh I declare that no flesh will glory in your presence God but we give glory to your glory God we say have your way I ask Lord that you speak through me God that your voice be heard in my voice and your words heard in my words and I speak over the atmosphere and ear to ear the ear of the Lord, that they would hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, Father. I declare that the Word of God will accomplish what it is set out to do, that it won't return void, that it will produce harvest and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 
to be comfortable, they need a new house. How many of y'all ever felt like that? I just want a new house. <laughs> Throw the whole house away. <laughs> but you know, if you were to take a much smaller budget and just redecorate what you have, throw out some old things, bring in some new things, make the most of the space you have realize that there's some clutter in the way and some junk in the way clear out the atmosphere that there's some memories that you've clung to that should have been removed from the house that you can get a new house feel in the same place you know nothing redecorates a house like worship Nothing changes an atmosphere. Nothing, nothing removes what you're looking at. The Bible says that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and we enter into his courts with praise. Some people don't understand that with a simple praise, I change the living room into the courtyard of God. That with a simple hallelujah, I change my couch into a throne room that I'm sitting there before the king. What it takes to really worship God. I'll give you two small things. Amy. It takes a boldness to worship God. Because you got to be bold to yourself because somewhere along your life you believed a lie that this is who you are, that you are quiet, that you are, are timid, that you don't make a scene. That, that, and Micah looked at David and said to David, you should be more dignified than this. Do you not know how a king is supposed to act? Now you're down there stripping in front of the maid servants. David said, it's going to get more undignified than this because it takes a certain boldness. I'm going to prove it to myself. I'm going to show everyone watching that I don't care what none of us think so long as God has my attention. That takes a boldness. It's not easy to always overcome what people think about how you look. That's why dieting is so beneficial financially if you operate in that realm. Because people spend billions about how other people think they look. Another thing it takes is it takes an understanding or a, a real faith to worship. Because the Bible says that if we want to come to him, see it takes a boldness because we understand that we approach the throne boldly. So if we're going to have him in the courts, we have to be able to be bold in approaching him. But, but it takes a faith because once we get him in the room, if we're going to even come to him, we have to first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So it takes a level of faith and boldness, a bold faith, and no, not timid faith. See, the problem with people who don't understand worship is usually one a timidity a fear of what will I look like how will I sound well, what if I make a fool of myself and nothing changes well, the Bible tells me God hasn't given me a spirit of timidity or fear but of love and power and a sound mind that, that, that fear that tries to restrict you out of praise because what if your neighbor thinks you look stupid well is your neighbor gonna pay your mortgage is your neighbor going to take that cancer? Is your neighbor going to fix your marriage? Is your neighbor going to be there after church for you? Nah, they're not going to be there. And the other thing that slows people down is not really knowing who God is because you can't have faith in that which you don't know. And a lot of us got book knowledge, but we ain't got no heart knowledge. 
as a reason David says taste and see because you can learn all the ingredients but until you put it in your mouth you can know everything about praise but until you put a praise in your mouth then you don't see an atmosphere shift say redecorate the house all right I'm gonna jump off in here I want to read. We're reading the same verses from uh, last week. Um, I'll just read Luke 11 again. I might read it all. It says Luke 11, 14 to 26. You guys have heard it for the last two weeks. I think I'm going to wrap this sermon up today. It's three weeks running now. It's three weeks running now. My wife says, don't touch it. Leave it alone so you can get through it. I touched it again. Just a smidge. It says, uh, and he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. Pause. I ain't talking about this today, but I often mention how there is a physical manifestation for spiritual oppression. Some people have children that are four or five years old and have never uttered a word. They'll take them to a speech therapist and to a counselor and all of these things, which is fine. But if you bring them to an altar and you redecorate the house with some worship, because Jesus didn't even address the fact that the, that the person was mute. He addressed the spirit. He didn't say speak. He cast out the demon. And then the child spoke. So, so a lot of times we are addressing symptoms and not causes. That mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. That's always their argument. They call this work the work of the devil. They call this work anti-progressive. They call this work, uh, sec it should be secondary. If you, if you recommend anything other than the standard treatment, if we say for cancer there's a better treatment than chemotherapy, they say we're crazy. If we say that there's a better treatment than radiation, they say we're crazy. They say, oh, they cast, that's, that's the devil's work. Others tested him, sought from him, a sign from heaven. But he knowing their thoughts, let me stop right there. I'm, I'm going to get through it. I'm going to get through it. <laughs> Others there asked him for a sign. See, there's two, two sides to this story. One of them is, is you shouldn't teach uh, healing over over medicine and we don't teach against medicine we just believe God's power they say we're crazy for it but the other side is the side that wants to see the miracle and not from faith but they want to show and they're the ones that get caught up and in, in find themselves in agreement with the first crowd because neither one of them deserve a miracle but they're both in the church so so they would plead a case to say it doesn't work but when you come just to see a sign, see, this is my thing, God can heal me, but if he doesn't, I'll never stop worshiping. I didn't come to get healed. I got healed because I came. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against this, a house falls. If Satan also was divided against himself how will his kingdom stand because you say I cast out demons by Beelzebub and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub by whom do your sons cast them out therefore they will be your judges but if I cast out demons with the finger of God surely the kingdom of God has come upon you let me say something y'all good I'm ready for today you got to be careful what you say about the way God moves. Because you know who, who the judges are for the way you talk about how God moves? Your children. So if you mock the healing of God, your sons will be your judges. This is what Jesus just said. He said, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, who do your sons cast them out by? Therefore, they will be your judges. The minute you start mocking a move of God, you lift the legacy of the power of God off of your children and subject them to the judgment that you just placed on the move of God. 
because through legacy they're going to say ain't no healing because mama said ain't no healing they're going to say ain't no submission to authority because mama and daddy wasn't submitted to authority they're going to say ain't no power because I never seen power at home my wife always say don't call babies ugly she said because we don't want our grandbabies to be ugly I say it's impossible that our grandbabies be ugly, but them babies is ugly. She said, she said, Lord, I ain't with him. I ain't with him. <laughs> she said, she started interceding for me. She said, our children ain't gonna be our judges. <laughs> oh man. All right, where we at? Therefore, they will be your judges. But, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. When a stronger man, stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. I always mention that Matthew 12 says empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Proverbs 25, 28 says this. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And lastly, Matthew 24, 43 says, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Amen. You may be seated. I had to speed through it because I go through it verse by verse. I'm, I'm hearing stuff in the prophetic. It's a quick recap. Very quick. We talked about there was four houses. You guys remember? Uh, four houses. One was uh, your actual home, your house you live in. The other was yourself, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the other is your bloodline, your legacy, the house of David. And the other is the house of God. So those are the four houses that all of these teachings affect. And then I talked last week um, about things that can enter into a house. Um, I didn't get all the way through that list. I had eight on the list. I got through seven and I have 14 things I want to push through today about what happens in the house. So um, last week, some of the things that can enter a house, one is a word. Two was a thief, right? Three was your peace. Four is the Holy Spirit. Five was unclean spirits, but not to be confused with the spirit of the thief because they are different. You guys remember that? Uh, division. Uh-oh, there we go. Division. Uh, and salvation. We ended on salvation. If you didn't catch that, go back and catch the last week's teaching because it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. Um, the eighth thing, if y'all taking notes, if you have your notes, and we're just going to jump off into it heavy today. Y'all ready? Yeah. Sons enter the house. Sons and daughters enter the house. The children of God enter the house. Um, slaves don't enter the house. John 8.35 says this, it says that, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. The reality of it is bondage does not belong in the house of God. In fact, bondage doesn't belong inside any house. Uh, what, what belongs in a house is legacy, is sonship. So there is the you that abides in the house of God as a son. Before we get to that, let's talk about the reverse way because this applies to all four houses, right? Um, you have to understand that the enemy is not your father. The enemy is not your father, and that has to be clarified for some people because it was in the church that Jesus looked at religious leaders and said, you are of your father, the devil, the father of lies. So, so the reality of it is there are people in the place that you worship in that have a different father. 
I can tell you who, who, who your daddy is by the worship service. I can either tell you who your daddy is by the worship service or the condition of your relationship. I'll tell you how. I was gone for a week this past week. When I came in the house, I was met by my dogs first. You know why? Because master is a stronger relationship than father. Father raises, master owns. Master provides all, all, father guides and instructs and protects, but master is responsible for everything. Total dependency. So my dogs meet me at the door first. Then my wife. Hey, hey, baby. She like to smell me. She come and hug me and just inhale. <laughs> Facts, right? <laughs> and then I go into the kitchen and the kids get up off of the things that they're on and walk into the kitchen to greet daddy, yeah. right? Um, now, if I had walked in the house and they just sat there using the money that I spent for the electric bill, <laughs> playing a video game that I bought on a TV that I hung and the house that I paid for, and not had gotten up to greet the father, it would say something about the condition of their heart towards me. Yes. Not the condition of my heart towards them. See, I provided it all without needing a hello. Uh -huh. But the fact that I could walk into a house and possibly not get one says that they either don't respect the provision, they don't uh, realize the provision, they don't care for the relationship outside of the stuff. See, see, I could tell you the condition of your relationship or who your daddy is yeah. by how you worship. Um, but, but our father is not the father of lies. We have a different spirit. The Bible says that we, we don't have a spirit that puts us into bondage uh, to fear again, but through a spirit of adoption, we cry out, Abba, Father, that we have been adopted, that we are co-heirs with Christ. We've been adopted by the father of lights versus being subject to the father of lies. The enemy has no right to come and go as he pleases. See, see, some people don't understand this because they ex still got a key to the house. Because he still got his socks in the dresser drawer. Some shoes in the closet, and that's his TV and PlayStation in the living room. <laughs> anyway, the enemy can't come and go as he pleases. There's a reason that the devil tells God when he comes up to heaven in the book of Job, uh, when he gives an account for where he's been and what he's doing, because understand this, that the devil can't come and go as he pleases. He has to give an account to our God. He can't even go be where he want to be without telling where he was at because he has to give an account to our God. So he comes up and God says, where you been? He says, well, I've been roaming to and fro, seeking who I may devour. Last I checked, Jesus said when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he roams through dry places looking for rest, but finds none. This was the devil's report. I've been roaming around and I ain't found nowhere to sit down. Seeking who I may devour means I haven't found whom I may devour. So, so this is the story. So he goes back to God empty handed. Because he can't come and go as he please. He says, he says, he says I've been seeking who I, who I may devour. He has no permission to walk into your situation. He has no permission to walk onto your property, to walk into your home, to walk up to your children. The enemy has no permission to touch your bank account or touch your body or touch your family or touch your legacy. God says, hey, have you tried Job? He says, man, God, you know you got to hedge around him. I can't get in or out of there as I wish because you're protecting him. The enemy needs permission from God to get in. He needs permission from you. The enemy cannot do whatever he wants to do. We give the devil too much credit. The devil is a pump. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> His worshipers are softer than him. The... Uh, <laughs> The, the reality, <laughs> don't get me preaching on the Lomachenko fight, Ariel. <laughs> the 
The enemy can't do whatever he wants to do. You know, here's, here's what some people have to do, and, and this is where, where you get disagreement when someone says something like this to you, is you believe it in your head, you hear it in your head, but it's hard to get into your heart because you have allowed the devil to do whatever he wants to do. And you sit back and say, if he can't do whatever he wants to do, then how come my money is always under attack? If he can't do whatever he wants to do, then how come my marriage is in this condition? If he can't do whatever it is he wants to do, how come my children acting up? How come my health is like this? How come I'm failing like this? No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You got to revoke the permissions. You've got to break the contracts that you have made and the permissions you have given and renounce all of this stuff in order to put the hedge back up. A lot of us are in spiritual contracts with things that give the enemy permission. Don't forget, he is the great accuser. He's the prosecutor. He's, he's the one who's into the legalities of it. We have to, you have to break contracts with the occult in order to stop some spiritual uh, things that are moving. You say, but yeah, I got saved. That's fine. But did you ever, did you ever renounce your contract with the occult? Them tarot cards that you had read to you over the telephone on the 900 number or at the Halloween party in jest. That Ouija board that you thought was just a party favor. Them horoscopes that you like to share on Facebook and check in the newspaper and on the Chinese food menu. Did you ever renounce your, your contract with the occult? You have to renounce your contracts with addiction. Uh, when you called it, when you said it's social or I can quit whenever I want to or this, and, and you made a deal, how does this sound? This is a new microphone. My sound man said you got to get a new microphone. I hated him for it. I forgive him now. I break the contract with bitterness in Jesus' name. <laughs> <laughs> you got to break that contract with depression. See, some people have, have made a contract with depression. They have given depression permission to live with them and, and enforce their thoughts. You know, the minute you agree to withhold your praise, you signed a contract with depression. Because the scriptural connection, Bible says, is put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. So the minute you take off the garment of praise, you have allowed heaviness to have residence. You have entered into contract. When you entered into that complaining, you signed a contract for heaviness. See, see, you thought your complaint was a campaign. You thought your complaint was to build agreement with an anger. You thought your complaint was you being critical or analytical. You found this out. But the problem is when you did it long enough, you convinced yourself that nothing was good. You convinced yourself that nothing will get better. When you decided that you shouldn't have God inhabit the praises of his people, you declared vacancy right here. Somebody got to break the contracts with sexual spirits. You got to get that boy his necklace back. You got you, you to gotta, you gotta quit hiding that girl's artifacts in that shoebox under the bed. S smelling them every time you go into the room. <laughs> I'm talking about perfume. Y'all talking silly. You got to break the contract with that foul thinking. <laughs> you got to. You got to. Y'all stop smelling them when y'all go in the room. <laughs> you got to break the contract. Somebody's got to break the contract with poverty. And some of these contracts are contracts y'all parents sign. You understand that, 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 that uh, the sins of the father are visited upon the sons for three or four generations. So, so some of you don't realize that you got to break a, a, a contract with the occult because your parents made it. That before you found Jesus, they were teaching you the practices. That before they found Jesus, they were encouraging you to be a free thinker. Slash rebellious. 
slash no order slash chaos because that's the realm of the witch. See, see, some of these contracts, your parents made these contracts with poverty. There's a reason why people who grow up in the projects raise people who grow up in the projects and they raise people that grow up in the projects while mama, daddy, and grandbaby all live across the street from each other in the same projects. There's a reason why, 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 why mama can tell you how to file for section eight but not how to fill out a Pell Grant application. <laughs> You gotta break contracts with poverty. When you decide that you'd rather qualify for this entitlement or this thing and not try, you have signed a contract. Uh, you sign that contract for poverty when you withhold your tithe. Because what happens is when you tithe, the Bible says that God rebukes the devourer for your sake. So the moment you withhold it, you invite the devourer. So the Bible says it's like putting your money in a bag with holes in it. Um, the Bible says that you have, you have robbed God in your tithes and offerings. The minute you withhold the tithe and the offering, you have taken up the spirit of the thief. You have taken up the nature of the thief. So you have switched fathers by contract. There's a different adoption that happens by contract. You sign contracts with poverty when you procrastinate. When you are lazy. Well, Jesus. I like to play Fortnite all night. <laughs> Late in the midnight hour. <laughs> Turn the PlayStation around. <laughs> The Bible says, a little folding of the hands to sleep, a little closing of the eyes to slumber, and poverty will overtake you like a bandit. It will steal from you because the devourer wasn't rebuked, because the lazy one is often the non-tither. Because those who are diligent know how to budget. They budget their time and they budget their economics and they budget their relationships because diligence produces fruit. The Bible says that the slugger sows out of season, goes, looks for harvest and finds none. You know why? It's diligence that produces fruit. That's why if you don't work, you don't eat, the Bible says. So unless you are under the father of lies, uh, then these are his sons. You understand that these contracts with these spirits, with, this, with the spiritual realm, that those spirits, those are his sons. So if you're under him, they can enter the house. Because sons can enter the house. But once you became a co-heir with Christ, right, that we're no longer of that kingdom, that we're no longer sons of disobedience, that the, once you became a co-heir with Christ, then these things that thought they were sons to him became slaves. Therefore, they have no residence in the house. Uh, what do you mean slaves, pastor? I'll tell you what I mean. The disciples came back to Jesus. They said, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Anyone subject to anyone else is someone under their authority. He says they're subject to us. Scripture says that all things work together for the good, which means even if you think you against me, you work for me because I own the situation. And a slave shall not enter this house. As a son or daughter of the living God, put your hand on yourself. Say, I'm a son or daughter. No, don't say that. Just pick one. Pick one. Pick which applies. This is not a trans Christian. Uh, <laughs> Somebody gonna get mad at that. I don't care. I said it. I said it. I'd take it further if you want, if it wasn't this message. Um, what are we talking about? Where the Lord at? <laughs> somebody, somebody, put your, somebody put your hand on your heart and, and, and say whatever applies. I'm a son and daughter of the living God. See, I'm a son of the living God. Uh, so I can go into the house. This is the thing. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because I know that if a son abides in the house, he abides in the house forever. 
Jesus said, not one would be plucked out of my hand that the Father has given to me. Scripture says, who can separate us from the love of God? List it, name it, name it, name it. Put the name down so I can declare that. Well, who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? No, 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 it don't work like that. Here's the thing about the believer who goes into the house. You can't go from house to house. Here's a scripture says, Luke 10, 7 says, and remain in the same house. Somebody yell, same house. Same house. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. That means whatever is flowing from worship, whatever is being fed at the table, don't leave talking about I ain't get fed. No, remain in the same house, eating and drinking that which is given. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. See, we have this uh, idea that the kingdom is a child's birthday party. That is just bounce houses everywhere. And that we can go from bounce house to bounce house, enjoying the features of it until we become bored with it and switch out and go to the next one and bounce around and bounce around and then go to the next one. And once we've ridden them all, we come back to the start to do it again. That's the modern day believer. That's, uh, that's called lukewarm. The Bible says be hot or cold. You're lukewarm. You get spewed out of, the, out of his mouth. The reality of it is you stay in the same house. Uh, let's talk about what happens in the houses. I'm going to give you 14 in 28 minutes. I'm not. I'm not. I promise. Uh, <laughs> first, first, first. Things get lost in the house. And I want to be specific with this one. This applies to everyone. This applies applies to you, uh, to your legacy, uh, to the house of God, and to your home. But I want to be specific. When When I elaborate on this, I'll talk probably more about what happens within the church than what happens within. But you can apply it inside, right? Things get lost in the house. Luke 15, 8 says, Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? First, says she lights a lamp. Understand this, that if we are the light of the world and we are supposed to give light to the whole house, it is our job to help find the things that are lost in the house. It is not just the pastor's job to help deal with everything that's lost. That, that you don't take a light and put it under a bushel, meaning don't hide yourself in the pew. Meaning don't hide yourself from the work. But you take that light and you put it on a lampstand and it gives light to the whole house. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. As long as I'm here, men can see clearly. But if it's darkness, they stumble. Wherever you refuse to light up, men stumble. Things get lost in the house. Here's here's the thing about getting lost in the house, and it's so sad because it is the reason why people leave the house, is that somewhere they got lost in the sauce. That they came in, here's the reasons why people will leave the church. If you miss a funeral, if you miss a birthing, if you miss a sickness, or something that is extremely important to an individual. This is why the church as a body has a responsibility to meet the needs of the body. Because if the pastor had to go to every wedding, funeral, uh, birthday party, graduation, uh, I'd be dead. That's why Louie is up in Connecticut right now. Doing a wedding. This dude got a collar on. Y'all seen it? I don't even own a collar. I done done 57 weddings in the same gray suit. <laughs> Louis got a collar. This cat been a pastor for a week and a half. <laughs> Louis, what you doing? <laughs> and to add insult to injury, that's not why I ain't up there. I ain't up there because they ain't asked me to do it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, no, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him. Uh, one of the toughest things to do is do a wedding. <laughs> what am I talking about? 
Oh, this is why people will leave. Why people will leave. This is why people will sit down and not and, and, and be squelched in the house that, that somebody overlooked them, that somebody said they would be there for them and they weren't there for them, that somebody had a gift that someone else did not recognize and that gift went untended to and unmentored and unde underdeveloped and that person just got lost in the house. I always say when it comes to salvation, because people say things like this, and you may have heard it before, I don't have a great testimony like you. Because I got a heck of a testimony. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to be alive, you know? But everyone don't have that story. And people will look and they've said to me, I don't have a story like you. I can't do what you do. And I tell people, you know, it's a bigger testimony to have been lost in the house than to have been the sheep that wandered off. Because, because when you're in the house, you're in a safe place. When you're in the house, you're protected. When you're in the house, you're in the atmosphere. When you're in the house, no one even thinks that you need anything and you don't think that you need anything. So to find Jesus from a place of not thinking you need anything, a place of comfort, is harder to hear the voice call you out than to hit rock bottom and reach up for help. So, that, so, so, so people who were raised in church who are on fire for Jesus, to me, have a bigger story to tell. Because I reached for God when I didn't need nothing is their story. I came in willingly when everything was okay. You came in because you had to. That near-death experience brought you to the altar. That pregnancy brought you to the altar. So people get lost in the house. That's not to be confused with ridiculous people who come to pout in the house. Here's the thing if you get lost in the house. Make some noise. I lose my wallet all the time. The remote, all the time. My, built, my, 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 my screwdriver bits, drill bits, all the time. I find them, I put them somewhere so I never lose them again. And then I forget where I put them. Lose stuff all the time. And if those things made noise, so I don't worry about losing my phone because I can go on another device and hit find my phone and play a sound and it'll make noise until I find it. If you get lost in the house, you have to make some noise so that you can be found. Uh, no one knows you're lost if you're quiet. So if you feel like you have gotten lost in the mix, the best thing for you to do is speak up. Closed mouths don't get fed. That's what my mama say. You got to make so much noise that somebody notices you're missing. You know when you come in and you are so quiet all the time, it, I live my life like this. If I leave the room and you did not miss anything when I left, I didn't make an impact. If I could disappear and you didn't realize it, then I should have never been there. You should make so much noise when you come into an atmosphere that if you left, somebody would notice you weren't there. Uh, things get lost in the house. Gifts get lost in the house. Talent get lost in the house. Um, also what happens in the house, this is kind of a dual thing, is that people return to the house. Somebody say amen. amen. And people abstain from entering the house. The Bible tells a story of the prodigal son. Very famous story, we all know it. Um, says that one son goes to his father and says, I want my inheritance now. Uh, he takes it and he spends all of it doing whatever he wants to do. Uh, Least a phantom, partying in Miami, all of this stuff, you know. And then, and then he went broke, and he ends up eating with pigs. He says, I go back to my father's house from which I came. He says that the servants in my father's house have it better than this. And, and he comes home. You know, as the people of God, we have to be ready to receive those who have a mind of bondage and who, uh, who have wasted or, or walked away from what God has done for them and usher them back into their inheritance. This is the call. When the, when the son starts walking in, his mindset has been shifted from I am a co-heir to I am a slave. The problem with that is slaves don't abide in the house. Only sons abide in the house. You can't even come home unless I usher you into inheritance. You can't even come. If you come in here and maintain the mentality of a slave, you won't be here long because slaves don't abide in the house forever. 
If I can't get you to adoption, if I can't get you to understand the value of a son or a daughter, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are the children of God. If I can't get you to that place, you won't be around long. This is why it breaks my heart for churches that are not Spirit-filled, because you can get somebody in, but they can't become children if they're not led by the Spirit. And sons abide in the house forever. So if they came into the house saying, you know what, if I could just do a little bit, I'd feel better. No, that's the mindset of the son who said, if I could be a servant in my father's house, you might be around for a minute, but you don't last long, which is why the retention in the ministry is not long. Comes down to being a son or a daughter of God. We have to be ready to push people from one side to the other, bring them in. The father says, give him the signet ring, put shoes on his feet, give him the best robe and kill the fatted calf because it's the blood of the lamb that brings him in and then the rest of this is reinstalling his inheritance and his authority because now he's a son in the house forever. People come home and if we are so bitter with people, see I've been done wrong by folk. I've been done wrong, done wrong by church folk. The streets treated me bad, but the church treated me worse. At least the people who shot at me in the streets, I knew they was going to shoot at me. Folks that shot at me in the church sat at my dinner table. They had they, they had they burner under the table aimed at me. It's all true. Just making it colorful for you. Um, but then we did this. And one of the things I told my wife is we have to be ready to receive any of them who did us wrong. What if one of those who did us wrong walks into this place seeking the presence of God? Do we take security to put them out of the door? Or do we bless those who cursed us and pray for those who spitefully misused us? Do, do we pray for our enemies? What, what do we do? At what point do we decide which son or daughter of God is not worthy of the grace of God? See, let me help you about judgment. For people who say only God can judge me, that is foolish. Everybody can judge you. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to judge you, right? The judgment of God that is described in the Bible that says judgment belongs to God is the eternal judgment that judges you worthy of his love, judges you worthy of his grace, judges you worthy of forgiveness, judges you worthy of a place in his kingdom. That is the judgment that we should not give to anybody. Otherwise, when it comes to judgment and judging the fruit, even the Bible says before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, it says, take the plank out of your own eye, making an emphasis that you have more problems than they do usually. But it says, the reason you take the plank out of your own eye is so you can rightly judge your brother. It don't say so that you will not judge your brother. It's that while you blind, you can't see straight. Fix your vision and then judge. So we have to be ready to bring people in. Uh, what happens is there's a development within the house that makes people stand outside the house because they don't like those who come into the house. When poor people get saved and your money is too good to stand next to them, you don't want to come in the house. When black, white, Asian, Latino, native get saved and your skin color is too proud to stand and worship next to them, you don't want to come into the house. Mm. Which is where you get into a lot of segregation in churches. Detour. <laughs> because you have black churches, you have white churches. You rarely have these churches. Your church should reflect your community. But there is an alignment when skin decides theology versus theology overriding skin that produces division within the house. Why is there even a terminology white church or black church versus God's church? If it's black church, that means skin is over God. If it's white church, it means skin is over God because you put the color before the king. 
And then you enter into contracts. Um, hear my heart. Hear my heart. There's a reason why a large number of black people vote Democrat. Even though most black Christians are against abortion as well. There's a reason why a lot of black pastors endorse Democrat, even though scripture says what it says. It's circular. Because the minute you came into contract with something that was anti-God, even under the understanding, y'all good? I'm, try I'm trying to walk softly here. Even under the understanding that I don't agree with that, but that's their right to choose. I'm, I'm not saying I'm for that, I just, it's ain't my business. But you cast your vote, puts you in agreement with it, which puts you under contract with it. Which is why 38% of abortions in America are performed by 6.5% of the nation, which is black women. Because what you come into contract with comes into the house. And now, if we have skin color churches, the black pastor over the black church has to cater to his audience. So you can't preach against it, or you're going to lose the 38% and whoever they're sleeping with. And you don't have a congregation. It started with a bribe. Forget that we believe this, we're going to give you this money. And the Bible says that those who take a bribe are wicked. And then it crept in through contract and the pastor had to take a bribe and say, I got to keep my tithers. Contract. I can go the other side as well. I can go the other side as well. But I want you to see that what we enter into in contract and people who say it's not my business. are usually people who are past childbearing age, people who are not going to have children, um, or people who already have their children. But let me ask you, for all of you not my business people, what if your daughter had an abortion? And because they don't tell you. They make sure that you don't have to tell the parents. As, as young as 14, 13 years old, you don't have to tell the parents, well, which one of you parents don't know that your grandbaby almost was here? And would it not be your business then? Somebody say contract. Uh, what am I talking about? Let's come back into it. Y'all good? That's my spill on that. No, I got to do it the other way, too. Because <laughs> when we get into the other side, we have the white church, which this is neither of, that has come in contract with devouring the house of the widow. I'm going to talk about that a little later. But Jesus addressed the Pharisees as saying, you have devoured the houses of widows. You prefer the best seat. You walk through the city with your robes on. And it talks about not caring about the poor. And, and in that, those who vote because they're on the side of life, but not on the side of living, come in contract with the theology that is opposite the only true religion, which is taking care of widows and orphans. And the minute you don't care about the weak and the helpless, you don't care when there is a shooting in the middle of a street because you have already justified death. So you call this a justified shooting because there is a contract. There has to be a renouncing of contracts. Amen. 
Yeah, I couldn't leave you out there by yourself. Don't vote for Joe Biden. <laughs> I don't care who you vote for. Vote for me. Write me in. <laughs> Kanye West 2020. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Somebody just left the church. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. I love y'all. Y'all know I love y'all. Number three. Oh, hold on a minute. I ain't done with number two. So what happens is people come home and others abstain from entering because those people are in the house. Republicans can't go worship with Democrats. Democrat, Democrats can't go worship with Republicans because one thinks they're more righteous than the other and the moment you do, your pride was found in you. And that was the first thing found in Lucifer. So, so the minute we play super righteous is the minute we become unrighteous because our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. But we decide I'm not entering into this thing. I don't want to serve with this one. I don't want a relationship with this one. The, the Bible says that the other son sat there and he refused to go into the party. The reality of it is he lived in the house but he wouldn't worship because of who else was worshiping. That, that he believed in his father but couldn't abide by his words because those words also applied to the other son. Oh, there is a problem in the house of God today. That young man said, that young man said, I hear you in there making merry with him and killing the fatted calf, this son of yours, this son of yours that took everything you had and squandered it with riotous living. But I've been here and I've been working the ground. Oh, look how righteous I am. I have not left you. I have maintained the lands and you have never even given me a small goat to make merry with my friends. You, that person is in such hatred of the position of their own life that they can't celebrate the winnings of someone else. That because I've worked hard and failed, I've kept the lands and I'm broke, only because you know how to do the work but don't know how to operate in faith. The father said, if you had just asked for a goat, everything here belongs to you. If you understood sonship, then you would know you could have whatever you want, but you chose to work and suffer versus work and celebrate. And so now here you are and in comes one who didn't work and he's being celebrated because you will walk in houses you have not labored for and harvest in fields you have not sown in. This, this my son was dead and now he lives and you can't come in? As we have people in the house that won't come in, won't come into worship, won't come into service, won't come in to agreement with truth, won't come into covenant with godly people, won't come in to, to order, they just won't come in. In the house, we have people that worship and withhold worship and criticize worship all within the house. The Bible say, see, I got a few more minutes, so I'm going to rip through them. The Bible say that there was a woman who comes in before Jesus with an alabaster box, right? And, and, and she breaks this thing that's worth a year's wages on his feet and the aroma filled the whole house because worship happens in the house. Uh, when you come into the house of God, you should smell a sweet smell and aroma. You should smell the sacrifice of praise. I don't care if it was a dancer's gallery yesterday and it was bare sweaty feet all over the floor. And when you walk in, it smelled like a, a wet dog and feet and butt, and all that stuff. The minute worship start going up, the fragrance changes. The Lord don't mind the gallery. <laughs> so long as he has his dancers in the altar. Uh, because worship fills the house. Understand, we fill the room with one uh, fragrance or another. You can be part of the worldly scent, a part of the worship scent. Because the Bible says that people were standing in the house that was just standing around watching when she walks in and does this, they weren't doing anything. And not only were they not doing anything, there was one in the corner that starts criticizing what she was doing. Uh, we could have sold that and gave it to the poor. How many of y'all go home and make fun of the cats that was worshiping in the church? <laughs> All right, let me ask you. Golly. How many, 
How many, how many of y'all got nicknames for some people in the room? Y'all acting all holy right now. I know y'all lying. I got nicknames for all of y'all right now. Lie. <laughs> people got nicknames for people in the room. You got ways that you describe people to people that you brought that they don't know. You can't say the name. They say, who is that? You say, the one that, 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 that. They say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Like, how you see all that? I had my eyes closed. I don't know what they did. <laughs> they said, what? No. So, so, so you got people that sit around and criticize worship. And th- the fun part is the fun part, but the mocking side of it is who they think they is. Who they think, I know, I know their backstory. I know what they just did last week. I know who they was talking to. They was just saying this about pastor. Now they want to stand up in front of him and shake his hand. They was just complaining about worship. Now they all up there, all, all kissing the worship past the butt with all in the altar. They fake. You get this that happens in the house. Um, six of us. <laughs> Here's what happens in the house. People, people are healed in the house and people are sick in the house. This is, the, this is the power of the kingdom. You bring, you bring those to the elders that they would lay hands on them and that they would be healed. Uh, Peter's mom was sick in the house. She had a fever. And when Jesus came into the house, he touched her and she was healed immediately because there are people in the house that are sick. And there are people in the house that get healed. Jairus' daughter was in the house and she was sick. And Jesus walks in and calls a little girl, get up, and she gets up out of her sickness. Not just sickness, her death. Her sickness was unto death and she gets up out of it because this happens in the house of God that those things that are dead get resurrection power spoke back into them because he is the resurrection and the life that so 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 this happens in the house one indicator that you are healed is your service one indicator that you are healed and strengthening is your feeding when the little girl gets up, she's instructed to be given something to eat. When, when, when Peter's mom gets up, she gets up and starts cleaning and cooking for them. Immediately. She gets up out of her bed right off of having a fever, she, and she goes right into service. Uh, one indicator that you are healed is your service. Those who have been touched or healed by God want to contribute to the atmosphere that he encountered them in. If your life has been changed in this atmosphere and you have not found it in you to desire to contribute, you're probably still sick. Anyone who thinks that they're healed from something but don't serve is still sick. They have a head sickness. They have an understanding sickness. They have a deception sickness. Because if you've been healed, you contribute. If you've been healed, you help. It's, 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 it's scriptural. There's a, there's a reason why you're still laying there, still not doing nothing, still just coming for you. It's probably because you still got a spiritual fever. Your temperature too hot to sit still. You still got spiritual chills. You don't want nobody to see how you move if you sit around too long because we'll be able to diagnose you. Jesus looked at the man and said, do you even want to be made well? Or do you just like come sitting at the water? You just like to come and sit at the well and complain about those getting healed. Or someone gets in front of me. Someone, someone steps in ahead of me. You just like to complain about what other people getting. Do you even want to be made well? Oppression happens in the house. A woman's daughter, a Seraphonician woman comes to Jesus. She says, my daughter's at home demon possessed. Uh, This happens in the house. This is why I never understood the idea that the church is filled with hypocrites. The church is filled with processing humanity. The church is filled with those who are going through sanctification. It's filled with those who have new spirits, are getting their minds renewed. uh, They have broken bodies and wounds that are getting, they're getting set free from. Peter was with Jesus for three years and still struggled with the enemy using him for the wrong purpose. Consider that. Walked physically with Jesus for three years. And when Jesus came to the climax of his ministry, Peter jumps in front of him and says, you will not do that. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. People have been taught just because that, uh, they got saved that they can no longer be oppressed. And this is why there's so many people that are oppressed. 
Because unless you took time to go through deliverance before receiving salvation, then whenever did you cast out the strong man? See, 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 uh, the way I learned it was you can, you can put a Band-Aid over the wound and it'll heal, look healed, but you won't have full mobility or usage of that limb unless you dig into it, locate the shrapnel or the affected metal or cutting agent, stick in another tool and pull it out. Now that hurts a lot more than a Band-Aid. But when it heals, you will be able to leap and jump, raise your hands high. You'll be able to do a different thing, full usage, unhindered by things and foreign objects in your body that don't belong there. After prayer, after fasting, after declarations, after scripture and applying the word, if there's still something that you can't be that you are driven to do by compulsion, anything you are compelled to do, that you do in compulsion is demonically influenced. The Bible tells us don't even give in compulsion. Don't even be manipulated to just give in compulsion, but give what you have set in your heart to give. The reality of it is anything you are driven to do, if you are driven to do a thing, that's not godly. Y'all just look right now, y'all going do 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 trying to evaluate some things are unrecognized residents until you've been in a new atmosphere long enough you don't even realize they're there until you move atmospheres what's normal is normal wherever is normal no one's going to call it out no one's going to see it no one's going to touch it uh healing this blind man jesus one blind man that he healed he looks at him and he takes him out of the city he said he lifts him one he spit in his eyes another one he just spoke to but this one he lifts him up by the hand and walks him out of the city the reason is if you sit in the same atmosphere you've always been in you're gonna be the same way you always been sometimes you got to switch atmospheres when he went into Jairus's daughter's room he had to kick out people because a lack of faith and crying and heaviness is not the atmosphere of the believer I, I can't mix mine with your mourning and your depression and your lack of faith and your mocking my, my calling and mocking what thus saith the Lord. I got to separate some things. So y'all get out. Let me bring in some prayer warriors. Let me bring in some of the faith field. Let me bring in the ones with authority. Keep the mother and the father and let's speak to a thing. That's why you uh, should go out of your way to connect when you come into a, the house. You should go out of your way to connect. You should not run in the house and run out the house. You should not come in and stand around and wait for someone to acknowledge you. Make some noise in the house. If you came with somebody and everybody in here came with somebody, everybody in here was invited by somebody, right? If you came with somebody, what you should do is be intentional about connecting to somebody outside of the somebody who brought you. The reason is that one friend can't be the tethering string between you and the ministry. Because the minute y'all fall out, y'all gone. The minute the one who brought you leave, all y'all leave. It's like a gypsy coven, nomads traveling around. Where are we going now? To the church this week? To the club this week? To the beach this week? What, what, what you want to do? <laughs> uh, don't make the responsibility of your connection somebody else's responsibility. You know, so many people come in and get mad because nobody spoke to them. Who you speak to? Because the Bible says you reap what you sow. You know, right? Be not deceived, God is not mocked. If you're quiet, you're going to get quiet. Ask the talkers in the room if we got any problem. <laughs> we ain't got no problem having folks talk to us. You're going to talk to me. <laughs> I'm going to step right in between your conversation. What? What you said? <laughs> I'm going to answer questions you ain't even asked me. Somebody say, what the bathroom? It's over here, bro. It's over here. What you got to do? Number one or two? <laughs> it's, over, it's over here. <laughs> Look, we're going we gonna to talk. we talking today. I understand, understand that the enemy has a vested interest in keeping you separated. 
this idea that I'm just here to heal is an idea that I'm just here to be bound by hell because separation is not the call of God. God said it is not good that man would be alone. The Bible says Jesus describes us as, as he is the vine, we are the branch, and we have been grafted in a wild olive branch, which means we have been taking what was separated and connected to that which was connected. It, the idea that I'm just sneaking in for my own healing. Uh, the spiritual hospital is not the regular hospital. Don't compare Jesus' house to Memorial because you can go into that emergency room, go into your own little pocket tied off and not talk to nobody but the doctor. But that's not how the house of God works. The house of God is that how iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. The reality of it is how will you get sharp staying alone? The enemy wants to keep you alone because where one can chase 1,000, two can set 10,000 to flight. That if two of you will touch and agree asking anything, it wouldn't be held back. So the enemy says, keep disconnected. You've been hurt before. They are liars. They are hypocrites. They are fake. You don't know them. We don't know you. But we want to. You got to get some eyes on you so that somebody can see what's going on in you that you can't see. You got to get your ears open and get a voice on you so that someone can speak into you and discern what you don't see. All right, I got five minutes and I'm getting out of here. I'm going to get, y'all just, y'all just write, take these notes, all right? I'm going to rip through them. Uh, this is what happens in the house of God. Uh, people misunderstand the difference between work, worship, uh, they misunderstand the difference between work, worship, and work as worship. Martha and Mary were in the house, right? One was worshiping, one was working. And there was a misunderstanding that Martha thought her work was as worship. And the reality of it is, when you serve, the Bible says, do everything as unto the Lord. So when you serve God, your service is worship until you draw the line in the sand between actual, actually sitting with God and just doing the work. The minute doing the work takes precedence over the presence of God, you are no longer working as worship. Because if you're doing the work as unto the Lord, as you're doing the work, you're also in his presence. Uh, what happens in the house is that we complain about others' blessings. This is a sad thing, that, com that competitive thing. The man got healed on the Sabbath, and they said, uh, you can't heal on the Sabbath. Why are you doing that? They're mad that this man, Jesus said, he's been bound up. You would let your, you would let your coat go get water, but he can't, he's got to be crippled. Um, personal revelation happens in the house. This is the great thing about the Spirit of God. If while I am preaching, you are not hearing things other than what I'm preaching, we have, a, we have an issue in the spirit of God. This is, this is why I be confused when I get on Facebook and I see y'all quote me on stuff I never said. I'm like, I didn't say that. Did I say that? And it's like, the Holy Ghost must have said it. This is why I pray God be the filter between me and you. Let them hear your voice in my voice, your words. Because when you hear the word, it should be confirming things you already heard, which should unlock a world of revelation around you. That Jesus said, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Not let he who has an ear hear what the teacher is saying. Uh, the teacher, I'm just here to unlock. I'm here to touch and agree, therefore unlocking a portal and giving you access to the heavenly. I'm your agreement partner. What happens in the house is people question God's authority. This is a scary one for the church, but people question God's authority. How can you stand in the house that God built, stand in the presence of God, see the movement of God, and then question whether God can do it for you or not? When Jesus healed the paralytic man, he looked at him, he said, your sins are forgiven. They said, who is he? They didn't say it out loud because they said he perceived in their thoughts. But they said, who is he that he can forgive sins? That we sit in our thinking and we'll hear, we'll hear someone declare a thing of faith and we'll say, I don't think that works for me. We'll hear someone declare, if you do this, God will do this. If you just lift up a praise God, and you say, I don't think it works like that. I don't think that works for me. We question God's authority, God's ability, how God moves. Betrayal happens in the house. Christian, um, get used to it. It's the world we live in. <laughs> no excuses. <laughs> There's always going to be a Judas at the table somewhere. Uh, don't worry. You work with the same Judases. They've been your best friends growing up. You ain't hate to your hometown yet. You didn't have a different best friend every year from the sixth grade to the ninth grade. You know? <laughs> and got a new one now. And uh, 
but you still love your hometown, love your alma mater, wear your, your high school jacket. Betrayal is a, is a thing that happens in life. It's not because people don't like you, it's because sometimes people think they know better for you than you do. Judas didn't betray Jesus because he hated him. Judas betrayed Jesus because he wanted to force his hand to come in like a reigning king. He thought that if he would get him arrested that Jesus would rise up and start the rebellion for the reigning of Israel. So, so, so his betrayal was because he thought he knew better than Jesus. A lot of times people do you wrong because they think their plan is better than yours, not because they despise you. In the house, houses are sown. Houses are sown. Yeah, get quiet in this Baptist church. <laughs> no, Peter says, he tells, he, Jesus tells the rich young ruler, go sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and follow me. He said, go sell your house. And he leaves because he had a lot of stuff. Right. Peter says, what about us? He says, we have given up everything. Jesus says, everyone who's given up homes, families, this thing he says, he says, you'll get a hundredfold in life to come and in this day. Houses are sown. This is what I mean. I'm not telling you go write your, your, your deed off on some Jim Jones, uh, great guy, a tragedy, nonsense. Um, what I'm saying is, like I said last week, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You know how you sow your house these days? You, you bring your family to serve the Lord. You bring your family to serve the house of God. You bring your family to the altar. You teach your children how to tithe. You teach your children how to pray. If I got five of y'all praying out of one household for me, I know I'm more protected than if it was just you. The, the rich young ruler wanted to follow Jesus alone, but when it required him to do something about his goods and his house, he couldn't do it. It's too many fathers that don't know how to lead their wives and children. It's too many, it's too many fathers that sit back and worship while the wife is laid on the altar. Too many parents who, who who can come in and, and worship but can't get their kids to the altar or can't get their kids. And no, you got to learn how to give your house. You never learn how to sow your house so long as you think preserving your house means sacrificing God's house. Houses are sown, but be careful. Because the reason people stop sowing houses is because church leaders devoured houses. Yeah, I'm bold enough to say it. The scripture says that you walked around in town with your robes and, and, and desired the high places and much respect, it says, and they have devoured the houses of widows. Uh, for the show, they have devoured the houses of uh, widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. It says these men will be punished most severely. Let me help you. You don't have to judge against who is a pimp in the pulpit. You don't gotta get caught up in reading articles on what pastor did what and who wanna buy a jet and if that's a problem or not and who wrote what book. Man, don't let your mind get on that stuff. The reality of it is those will be punished much more severely. The people in my position have to do better. We have to do better in what we do. We have to be called rather than careered. Too many in this day are careered and not called that this can get me a nice robe and respect in the marketplace. And I don't care what it costs you for me to get it this way. See, a man that's called will say, I don't need all of that. I'll take less so that we can all have more. A man like that says, the house of God, I can't expect you to sow your house if I won't sow mine. So I'm starting here. I lead from the front because a seed produces a harvest. So I don't require of you what I don't require of me. Uh, we live in the day where we can't discern between hirelings and shepherds. Hirelings that run from the wolf when the wolf comes. Teach me leadership or you can teach me how to fight. Fighters become leaders. But leaders can get their teeth knocked out when the world hit them. Because this thing that we live in is warfare. Uh, you can entertain me or you can teach me what worship is. Uh, and don't teach me what worship is by ingredients. Teach me by taste. Teach me by example. Show me. I need this. If your pastor don't worship, you better run. If you watch it online and your pastor don't worship, you're in the wrong house. Because when you come into the house of worship... The first one worshiping is the Levitical priesthood. It is the job and the calling of the priest to worship God, to burn the incense in the temple, to go into the Holy of Holies. Even though we all have access now, our call has not changed. We should put up a praise to the Lord. So you should learn how to worship or be taught how to worship by example. 
teach me how to do well in life or teach me that life abundantly that Jesus told about? I don't need life skills. I need life power. I don't need life skills. I need life favor. I don't need life skills. I need life provision and protection in the house of the Father, in the presence of the Father. I don't need to know how to stock the cupboards, but not know how to watch for the foxes. See, I appreciate, I appreciate all of the green pastures, but what about that wolf? I don't need to know how to have the bread of life with the leaven of the Pharisees. Who's going to pray for me? That's what I want to know. Who's going to pray for me? Who's going to pray with me? And then who's going to teach me how to pray so I can pray with you for somebody else? I need to know how, how this thing is going to work. I need to know who can lay hands on me, who can heal me, who can get me up, and then who can impart the gift and then fan into flames that which God has put on me. Don't, 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 don't send me home with three points in the poem. Send me home on fire. But in the house, God is accused, abused, and put on trial. We have turned the house of God into a place to come and critique God's work. We have turned the house of God into a place to come and battle the pastor and what he's saying with what we're seeing all day and say, well, God didn't do that for me. God didn't do that for me. Where's your God now? Where's this and this and that? And we, it's not new. They took Jesus to the high priest's house to beat him and accuse him and try him. They, it, it happens within the house. 14th thing that happens is that light is shined in the house. So that you put that light on the lampstand. Elevation is a part of the household of God. That those, those who love God are put on a lampstand to light up the whole house. To light up the whole house. It says shine your light before men that they may see your good works and bless the Father that's in heaven. So I'm not going to finish this today. Because it's 11.55. And I'll just deal with this next week. I know all y'all willing to stay another 30 minutes, but I don't want to keep you because I love you. Father God, we thank you for who you are. There is none like you, Jesus. Father, we ask, Lord, that you give us discernment to always be watchful and protecting of your house. Father, that we would be able to see those who are lost in the house. Father, that you would put a boldness on those who are lost to speak up. And I break offense in Jesus' name. The offense of the one who was lost and the offense of the one who was not aware that they were lost. Father, I break that strife that happens in your house. I declare in this house that it will not be divided amongst its own self and it will not fall in Jesus' name. Father, I pray, Lord, that you touch every portion of this house to protect it that nothing would be devoured by this house that this is the house of abundance father but that we don't mind giving because you are a god who returns it uh, tenfold a hundredfold father in jesus name father i pray right now that everything that is sick in the house find healing god that healing come to it in the name of jesus that service will come out of that that people will find their purpose i declare in jesus name in this house that lights would shine i break the spirit of the bushel that would try to cover the lights of the people of God in Jesus name I pray right now God that in this house God that there will be a spirit of welcoming and welcome home God that those who have been lost will be ushered into inheritance in Jesus name I break the spirit that would keep people separated from coming into the house in Jesus name God and we just thank you for who you are God we ask you to make this house a great house we thank you for the diversity of this house. Your word declares, God, that in a great house, there are many vessels, some of honor and some of dishonor. I pray, God, that you would use those that you have placed in this house as you see fit, God, every joint supplied in Jesus' name, God, because you have placed us. Use us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I sped through those because I'm going to turn the corner next week. I'm going to finish these last couple points next week, but I'm turning the corner hard, and we're going we're gonna to hit it hard. Y'all ready for that? But when you came in the house, somebody say the house. house. You received an envelope. That envelope says tithe and offering. 
Uh, there's three ways you can give here. You can give through the envelope, you can give through the cash app, or through the app online there. You can text the word give, it'll take you to the app. Um, we believe here in this house that giving is an act of worship. We believe here in this house that we can fill the atmosphere with worship with a great smell to God. It doesn't matter what the oil costs. We believe that it belongs on the feet of Jesus. We believe in this house that we can never outgive God. And so uh, give what you have set in your heart to give. Let the Holy Spirit use you. Take a, take a moment if this is your first time giving and just say a little prayer and break the contract that the enemy thinks that he has with your economics before you give. Just break that contract and say, you know what, God rebuke the devourer for my sake. And I'm just going to pray over it and they're going to receive it and they're going to give the announcements here. Father God, we thank you for who you are. Everything that we have comes from you. There's nothing that we have that we have because we got it ourselves, but because you have been faithful and blessed us. So God, we give you this portion back. God, I ask that you, that you bless it, that you stretch it, that you do more with it than is humanly possible, God. That you touch it like the jar of oil from the widow, God, or like the fish and loaves from the boy, God, that you just meet needs everywhere. I pray for the giver that it come back to him in good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over that men would give into their bosom. I declare favor will find them. I declare heart harvest will chase them down. I declare, God, that, that harvest will come to them this week from seeds they've sown years ago, Father. I declare the redeeming of time and the restoring of years to the giver in this place. And we renounce the contract of the enemy in Jesus' name. Uh, we rebuke the devourer in Jesus' name. We sew up the holes in our money bag in Jesus' name. I declare that that which is held by those who give in this house is kept and overflowed by those who dwell in this house in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Wait.